what are these, you know, darker forces doing? So they're involved, in my opinion, in some kind of what I would describe as a kind of a psychic cannibalism. So they're literally feeding off the energy of human beings. That they're, they're trying to experience 3D uh, density, and they can only do it through a kind of avatars of various kinds. Uh, and so we're one of the people that they're doing it with. I think also, as you mentioned, there's internecine warfare going on. And you find this in the scriptures all the time. You know, all these Roman gods and all these Greek gods and the Sumerian gods, you know, and then the Hebrew scriptures, all these other uh, uh, gods, and they're all fighting with each other. So they're either regional divinities or they're tribal divinities. And they co-opt us. We get conscripted into kind of their proxy wars. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guest is Father Sean O'Leary, PhD. Father Sean was ordained a Catholic priest in 1972 and spent the next 14 years working among the Kalenji people of East Africa. He has a PhD in transpersonal psychology and is a licensed clinical psychologist. Sean lectures and conducts scientific research on the effects of prayer and has authored five books, his latest being Setting God Free. Sean is the co-founder and the spiritual director of a non-denominational community called Companions on the Journey, based in Palo Alto. A big thank you to our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Paleo Valley and Organifi, and our podcast sponsor, Wild Pastures. Their support is essential in producing this podcast, and we hope you will show your support by visiting them online and trying all the amazing products that they produce. Please check the show notes for links and details. The topic of today's episode with Paul and Sean is Rise, Spiritual Warriors, Rise. If you haven't listened to my first podcast with Sean, it's freaking mind-blowingly good. All of his podcasts, he recently did one with Kyle Kingsbury that was fantastic as well on the Kyle Kingsbury show. Sean's the author of one of the best books I've ever read called Setting God Free. It's a phenomenal piece of work on religion, on God on spiritual development. It's one of the top books in my library, which for those of you that know me, that's quite a big statement because I have about 5,000 books. So to make it into the top 10 books in my library means you're badass. And that is you, Sean. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm selfishly excited because I just get to hang out with you for couple hours here and soak up your juice, baby. (laughs) So uh, we had such a good time and I got great feedback on our last podcast together. So I'm really uh, excited to share with you today. And our first question today, Sean, Jung stated that the Imago Dei archetype, which for those of you that aren't familiar with the term Imago Dei, it means image of deity, is the archetype from which all other archetypes within the human psyche emerge and that all the other archetypes emerge from it. He also said regarding the Imago Dei that is, it is unclear whether our Imago Dei creates us or we create it. This essentially means that all aspects of our perception are influenced by our Imago Dei or our image of deity. Do you feel our Imago Dei, our image of God, creates us or do we create it or both right great great questions paul and so when i think of an archetype for me they're connected with complex and most people mistake what a complex is you know if you hear about somebody with a mother complex you will begin to think you know the person has kind of hang up around his mother and that is not what it means so the archetype is the imprint you know whereas the complex is the uh uh the concatenation of associated experiences around the, the archetype. So every baby comes into the world with the archetype of a mother imprinted on its soul. It knows it's going to encounter a woman with breasts and milk that cuddles it and loves it and protects it. So that's the archetype and it's perfect. But the child comes into the world and is going to meet a real woman who's going to be less than perfect. And so now <laughs> yeah. the child, yeah, the child is going to build up a whole bunch of actual experiences around the real mother. And that's what Jung meant by the complex. So it's the um, cluster of emotionally associated experiences around the archetype of the mother. So there's a big difference then between the complex and the archetype. And uh, Plato got there a long, long time before Jung. Plato talked about the ideal realm, that the place of the, the perfect forms, like a perfect circle. But there is no way you can produce a perfect circle, you know, on Earth. Even if you use a protractor, 
because the surface area of the page and you can the um, the movement of the pencil tip or whatever is never going to be perfect. So there's a big difference then between the archetype and the complex between the ultimate ideal form of something and then the actual you know experience that we have on planet Earth. So just a few weeks ago, I had this really powerful visionary experience. You know, I talk about that the source created what I call holographic fractals of itself, that God is really lonely. If God is all that there is, then experiences are impossible. And so we try to get around that in uh, Christian theology by talking about three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, as if somehow they could relate to each other and that would create experiences. That's really just talking about the ways in which we experience God. It's not an ontological description of who God is in herself. And so what happens then is God self-fractured into billions of pieces. You know, in, in, in the Hebrew cosmology, they call this netzotzim. So holographic fractals of source. And the hologram is that which contains the totality of itself in every one of its component parts. And a, a fractal is an image that repeats that an infinite number of scales. So now we got holographic fractals, souls. And I had this vision of, about uh, three or four weeks ago uh, that God called the very first synod. And I call this synod, I call it the pre-cosmic uh, uh, creation uh, contract. So all of these factors got together with God and says, let's do something fun. And so they decided to create a cosmos. So this was a kind of a, yeah, kind of, um, a group decision. They all figured, let's do it in, in particular ways. So together with God, we created this cosmos that we live in right now. Uh, and it was like a toy. And we were delighted with it and play around with it. And then there was a second synod called. And the function of the second synod was, I wonder what would happen if we could insert ourselves into actually into that cosmos and play the roles of avatars of various kinds. So we created, you know, avatars at many, 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 many dimensions, 10 dimensional beings who are angelic, you know, pure light. And then the really, really tough souls volunteered for 3D reality, you know, where we're locked into these, uh, these space suits of ours. So in some senses, then, to answer your question directly, I believe that source is responsible for the, the creation of the fractals, the holographic fractals. So it begins with source. But then we have returned the compliment and we've recreated God in our own image and likeness. And we've done that through another Jungian concept called the projection of the shadow. Now, Jung says that the shadow is 80% gold. It is 80% unrealized potential. All the possibilities are resident within us that we haven't kind of expressed. And it is 20% repressed traumata or uh, uh, darkness. Now, so we projected both of them, you know, onto source. And so all the goodness and all the love and the compassion and whatever, we ascribe that to God. And we also ascribe to God, you know, the reason for wars and fighting, whatever we claim, God told us to do it. And so we, when we project onto a, another individual, either we fall in love with that person, you know, or we uh, have, you know, problems in relationship with them, uh, depending on what part of the shadow I projected. If we do that as a group onto another group, then you've got group prejudices. If we do it onto the planet, we regard the planet as mere resources and, you know, we rape it. And when we do it onto God, we create the God that we find in so many of the scriptural traditions of the world. So God initiated this process, you know, and we repaired the, the complement in spades. What you're saying, if I'm hearing you right, is that both are true. God creates us, but we also create God through our own complexes. Just, just to put a little caveat in there, Jung's definition of a complex is an emotionally charged network of neurological Absolutely. associations. So I think the reason that's important is because we have a massive network of associations, but it's the emotionally charged ones that actually develop an autonomic personality of their own and can even become sub-personalities, like multiple personality disorder is really a bunch of complexes talking to each other. And even, even a lot of what people think of as possessions turns out, in my experience, working with loads of them to be complexes. So you're absolutely right, Paul. Yeah. So the emotion is vital because the infant comes in, it's going to take it seven years to reach the use of reason. It can't, it can't kind of uh, uh, reason stuff out. So it's dependent upon its uh, physiological reactions to the environment in which it finds itself. And it can only express that emotionally. It's going to cry or laugh or giggle or whatever. And so the initial cluster of experiences are all based on emotions that the little neonate is experiencing. So you're right on. Very good. I've, I've found 
especially when working with people that have chronic health problems like diseases and fibromyalgia and any number of them, you know, cr even chronic structural problems, back pain, neck pain, that once I start looking into the causative factors, it almost always comes down to relationship challenges of some kind, either relationship one, with oneself, with other people, with spouses, with parents, with places, with things, with addictions. But then when I look at the beliefs that are driving the choices that are leading to the challenges, and then I look at the fears involved, because I, I like to use Mark Wu Lin's work, and one of his things that I really picked up from him that I found helpful is always to look at what is a person's greatest fear. Right, because that, absolutely. that always points back to the complex that's active. I would say in 95% of the cases I've looked into, which is thousands of them, it's always something to do with the belief about God. And many, many times I've sat down with people and they're quoting Bible scriptures and I go, okay, let's look at that. And so then I help break it down and I say, okay, now would you, would you like a, uh, another interpretation of that or a, a different perspective on that? And I always use... Houston Smith's model, which you and I talked about, the four levels of scriptural interpretation. Literal is the lowest level. Ethnocentric, second lowest level. Allegorical, next highest level. And then inspirational is the highest level of scriptural interpretation. And in every single case, Sean, it's a literal interpretation it's followed second by an ethnocentric, my group against your group, that's leading to this conflict in relationships. So I think it's very, very important. And even in atheists, what I found is atheists don't realize that they're in a Christian culture. So oftentimes the things that they don't even associate with God are actually problems related to beliefs that they don't even categorize but once they look at, with the help of someone like me or you, realize they're dealing with the same religious underpinnings in their own psyche, but th they just have externalized it as something other than related to God. And as you know, Jung said, for something to be rejected, it must first be real. So that right. quite, <laughs> you know, that's quite a little paradox for Richard right. Dawkins right. to deal with. So thank you for that. I think that's a very important perspective. My next question is religions and beliefs about God, what God wants or who are or are not God's people or the right people to deserve to live have been the basis of a tremendous amount of warfare and genocide throughout human history. We also read in various scriptures of the world religions that gods are at war. This goes all the way back to the Sumerian tablets. Th Thoth speaks of the dark forces or beings in the Emerald Tablets. I've read it myself. So the questions sure. I want to ask you in this regard are, one, how much of the strife and genocide in the world today do you feel is a direct product or byproduct of confused religious beliefs? Then, how much of the human situation to today do you feel is coming from higher dimensional beings essentially acting their dramas out through us versus being a product of a lack of spiritual development and heart-centered awareness in each individual? And then what practical suggestions can we all use to help bring harmony within ourselves, each other, and contribute to world healing and world peace that you can offer? So now that I've laid the groundwork, uh, how much of the strife and genocide in the world do you feel today in the world are a byproduct of confused religious beliefs? Great. And so the, the first remark I'd make is, how many weeks do we have, Paul? As many as it takes, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to get to the first one. So I like to go back to the kind of the beginning. Homo sapiens evolved about 200,000 years ago. You know, wise men. Uh, but they didn't have language. Um, so they had the ability to think and kind of figure out situations and respond and react. But language only developed 70,000 years ago with Homo sapiens sapiens. And I believe that the very first purpose to which we put uh, our uh, spoken language was to start telling stories. And primarily there were stories about where do we come from? Who's responsible for this? What happens when we die? Uh, these kinds of existential questions. So what I, fi I figured out is that we then created, you know, three different kinds of gods. The first kind I call tribal divinities, 
who were attached to a particular people, and that they followed them around. So if there was a nomadic group of people, this particular god followed them around and was responsible for them. Then the second group were kind of regional divinities. They occupied particular part, pieces of real estate. And if you moved into their territory, you had to pay you know, respect to them. And if you moved into a, place, a different place, there were different gods there. And that was part of the problem the Romans had with, uh, with, with uh, Judaism, that, you know, that uh, Jews in the diaspora refused to uh, uh, kind of worship the Roman gods. And that could bring down all kinds of kind of wrath from the Roman gods. So the second kind are regional divinities. You know, you be careful whose territory you're in. You have to kind of pay fealty to that particular god there. And the third one I call portfolio divinities. So these were gods with a particular ability. So if you were interested in agriculture, here's the guy you needed to follow. If you were interested in art, here's the guy you needed to follow. If you were interested in warfare, here's the guy you needed to follow. So now we divide it up into three different kinds of gods. So when you then begin to track people's, you know, kind of religious affiliation, you have to ask yourself the question, uh, which of these gods are they are actually following? So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say then is that most religions start off with some kind of a mystical impulse. Some great meditator or some great shaman had a visionary experience and brought back some kind of a message. You know? And so it starts off with this deeply mystical impulse. But then inevitably, it gets hijacked. You know? So uh, you start, for instance, let's say a, a character like Jesus Christ. You start with this extraordinary charismatic healer, and he attracts a group of disciples. Stage two is the disciples. Stage three is uh, the the um, the mystic is often killed. <laughs> yeah, away with, unfortunately, be, <laughs> absolutely. Stage three, stage four, the disciples now create a community. Stage five is the community morphs into an organization. Stage six is that some little oligarchy takes over the organization, and then they insist on kind of orthodoxy as they define it, and then it leads to uh, inquisitions to people inside the system who won't believe, and then crusades for people outside who won't believe. And then at some stage, it spins up a brand new uh, prophet within the system, like a Francis of Assisi in the 1200s. And so I see that happening again and again and again, and I see it in every human endeavor. It's not just in religion. I see it in our three-letter agencies, you know, those who are supposed to protect us from domestic terrorism and foreign terrorism, you know, and be in charge of our health services. And they've been hacked and hijacked, and now they're in the service of something else, certainly not of uh, the, the population. And so all kinds of human institutions, you know, no matter how beautifully they start off, almost inevitably they're going to be hijacked uh, by some kind of a tyrannical oligarch oligarchy uh, who are more interested in kind of feathering their own nests than in actually looking out for their constituents. So I see fundamentalism in many, many, many different systems, not just in religion. And it always has four stages, fundamentalism. The first stage is you take some really, really complex phenomenon like God. And you reduce it down to a bumper sticker that everybody <laughs> can understand. Yeah. So you take, you know, the, the summa theological of Thomas Aquinas and you reduce it down to a bumper sticker. That's the second stage. You reduce it to a bumper sticker. The third stage is you have to either identify or else create an enemy figure that you're going to go, have to go against. And then stage four is you're going to make war uh, on that person or on that group. So I see this happening again and again and again in all fundamentalist systems, whether they're political, economic, or, or religious. And so for me, that's how I see you know, that religious beliefs particularly have been a very, very potent way of organizing people into a kind of a fear-based, tyrannical, fundamentalist kind of thinking. Because if you're talking about the ultimate source of the universe and saying that yeah, we're in contact with, with him and here's what he said, you know, you can disagree with uh, the finance minister or the kind, of the kind of cultural minister in the parliament, but you can't disagree with God. So as long as people were God-fearing rather than God-loving, then you could certainly use religion as a very, very powerful tool to dominate and make fe people fearful. I'm looking here for the deeper reason why we have this archetypal pattern in us, because as you said, you've seen it repeated over and over again. And if anything, what comes to me, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on this, it's almost as though it's a mechanism by which we ultimately go through, just like we have a human birth, we are a child, we become a warrior, we become a king or a queen, and then we potentially can become a wise man. So that's my four life process archetypes. But ultimately, there's... A transition. It's like they say in science, science never changes until the leaders die. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. So what I'm trying to point out when I when I listen to the stages you're talking about, it's almost as though it's like a plant grows, matures, fruits, and then dies. It, it seems as like it's almost like a self-digesting process, so that it guarantees we don't get stuck for too long with any ideology. Would that be a, a fair interpretation? Yeah. So let me back up to something you said a few minutes ago, which was really profound as well. As a psychologist as well, I, I believe that every little neonate arrives with just uh, two emotions, the ability to feel fear and the ability to feel love. And if fear is self-directed, it becomes depression or anxiety. And if fear is other-directed, it becomes anger and rage. And when love is self-directed, it becomes self-esteem. And when love is other-directed, it becomes compassion. Now, the deepest, the deepest fear of all of a child is not just the fear of being unloved, but the fear of being unlovable. So the child with the archetype of mother comes in and finds you know, a real flesh and blood woman you know, who has to go shopping or go to the bathroom or whatever and is not available 24-7. And so the child you know, feels rejected. This is just emotion. This is not reason here. And so the child feels rejected. And since mother is God, so for the child, the archetype of mother is the archetype of the divine. And so if the mother is not there for me or I'm rejected by the mother, I'm being rejected by God, which means I'm not just unloved, I am unlovable. Now, I think as we grow up, we project that archetype, you know, at uh, different levels of, um, of the fractal, different kind of mag magnitudes of fractal, until finally, you know, we project, you know, on the God in the heavens, and then we project on our enemies outside, so uh, the people who don't love us. And so this, this extraordinary fear of being unlovable, you know, in some senses, is driving the enterprise. But at some stage, we have to, as you say, you know, there's a birthing process. And, you know, I've been talking a lot about this in the last few weeks, actually. When you look at the birthing process, the birthing process happens with the kind of um, the, the, the blood and the sweat. And sometimes, because the mother is pressing furiously, sometimes the excrement, you know, a part of the birthing process, right? And so we're birthing a new consciousness. And we're going to experience the very same phenomena. We're going, to, we're going to have to do this with blood and sweat and tears. And we're going to be in the shit as we do this process. As you say, this is part of the trajectory. You can't bring new life into the world unless there's some kind of, even fertilizer, even if you're a plant life, you've got to put fertilizer, literally cow shit in Ireland to help it to grow. So nothing is wasted and no experiences are wasted. The question then becomes, can I hold that mindset, that long-term mindset, that, you know, that evolutionary mindset? the destination of that, because we, there's a devolutionary process as we move from, you know, bite-sized pieces of God down through the various levels of psychic abilities, mental abilities, emotional abilities, etheric abilities, and finally just being locked into these 3D physical spacesuits. And in some sense, that's the lower point of devolution. And then we begin the journey back out again, and we grow through these. So we have to be able to um, somehow find the ability at the lowest point, to envision the highest point and to know what are the kind of the practices and the mind, the mindset and the consciousness that's going to take us back up to union with source again. Yeah, that's extremely important and very, very beautifully well stated as well. <laughs> what rises in me is there's just a lack of psychologists with the kind of spiritual depth that you display. And I think that psychology itself is very, very well needed right now, but because We've got, you know, behavioral psychology and, and so many of these other branches that aren't really spiritually rooted anymore. They're more like mechanistic psychology. It's just moving pieces around on a chessboard as opposed to really understanding the roots of these deeper issues. You know, because of the state that people are in, it takes a psychological approach, which is, as you know, an understanding of the soul, which is uh, really lacking. Hi, everybody. Thank you for learning and growing with me and joining me on my podcast. A quick question for you. Do you know if you're getting enough magnesium? Because four out of five Americans aren't, and that's pretty much true worldwide. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 600 biochemical reactions in your body. Today, I want to talk to you about the most common signs to look for that could indicate that you're magnesium deficient. Listen carefully to the end because there's a special offer happening 
And this could be exactly what you need. So here we go on some of the common symptoms that indicate you might be magnesium deficient. Are you irritable or anxious? If you're not sure, ask your partner. <laughs> Do you struggle with insomnia? Do you experience muscle cramps or twitches? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you constipated? Do you have a hard time falling asleep or getting a restful sleep? Do you feel more stressed than others that seem to be in the same or similar situations? Do you feel moody and wish your emotions were more stable? Do you feel you lack mental alertness? Do you feel you're at risk for osteoporosis and desire to build stronger bones? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency, so these are just a few of the most common ones. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body simply can't absorb. That's why I personally recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only full-spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually use and absorb. All Bioptimizer supplements are the best of the options available, or I wouldn't be offering them to you. I don't offer anything on my podcast that my family and I don't use ourselves. Bioptimizers is so committed to offering you the best quality products that really work that if you are not satisfied, you can get a full refund, no questions asked. In fact, they are so confident they offer a 365-day money-back guarantee. To get your magnesium breakthrough and your 10% Living 4D discount, go to B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com forward slash living number 4D. That's by optimizers.com forward slash living number 4D. Use the promo code Paul10 to get your discount. And by the way, in addition to the discount you get by using the promo code Paul10, you can get gifts with your purchase, up to two travel size bottles of magnesium breakthrough. Act fast. This is a limited time offer. So go to bioptimizers.com forward slash living 4D and use the promo code Paul10 for your 10% discount. Enjoy. So the next question on that regard was, how much of the human situation do you feel today is coming from higher dimensional beings acting their dramas out through us versus being the product of a lack of our own spiritual development or heart-centered awareness? And, you know, I bring that up because having studied a lot of scripture in my life and studied things like Sumerian tablets and, and the Hindu scriptures, there's reference to higher beings Absolutely. Being at war all the time. I mean, this is Absolutely. across the board. And Steiner Steiner describes the creation of the human beings by angelic beings. And he says they pour themselves into us, which is a very interesting concept because it means that what we think we are is actually angels living themselves out through us, which is a very different conception. How much of it is really Paul Check's fault or Sean's fault or anyone else's versus not realizing that, you know, at the unconscious level, we're, we're being enacted. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant question, Paul. Yeah, we're all familiar with the notion of the cargo cults, you know, that um, during World War II particularly, that there were little islands in the Indonesian area, you know, which had never seen outsiders before. And now Japanese and American aircraft are landing there as staging places for the, the war in the, in the, against Japan. These uh, people are coming down in these planes with all kinds of uh, goodies, cargo. When the war was finished, they disappeared. And the local people started creating rituals and started try trying to create radio, look like radios and airplanes, you know, little wooden airplanes, to try to kind of ask these guys to come back again and bring more cargo. So they're called the cargo gulls. So somebody said famously one time that any sufficiently adv technologically advanced society is going to look like gods to um, a technologically disadvantaged group. And so these people in those islands, they thought these were gods coming from the skies in these flying machines. And so we're all subject to this kind of cargo cult mentality. Now, as well as that, then you have the fact that there are parts of this universe that are literally three times older than our solar system. We're 4.6 billion years old. The universe is 13.8. So literally, there are parts of the universe which are literally three times older than us. And to imagine that life didn't happen elsewhere and that it didn't advance significantly. You look at where we've gone in the last like 5,000 years technologically. And if these guys have like a billion years advantage on us, what technology are they capable of? A lot. To think that they just, <laughs> yeah. To think that they just stayed at home. I kind of... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're, so they're, they're still yeah. watching football and drinking beer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so the, the problem is that increased intelligence doesn't necessarily correlate with increased spirituality. Because the greater the the greater the abilities, the greater the temptations, yep. which is the kind of the, uh, the scriptural story of the fallen angels, you know, who want to, to rebel. So I think then the example I use is that I look at Europe in the 17 and 1800s, sending people to Africa. The first group went uh, military people to conquer the land for king and country. That was their agenda. The next group came and said, oh, there's lots of fertile land here. Let's go grab it. So the farming class went in, and they just they wanted the land. They didn't give a damn about the king. They wanted land for themselves. The third group went in, and they're anthropologists. They wanted to figure out how do these people live? What's their language like? So they're interested in the kind of uh, linguistics and culture. Then the fourth group went, and they're missionaries. And I was one of these in some senses. I was a headmaster of a high school for a few years. I was involved with famine relief. I was involved with uh, agriculture because I worked with the uh, nomadic pastoralists. And so the other people went in from the goodness of their heart, you know, kind of, uh, kind of um, raise the mortality level of little babies. So you got all these different agendas coming from a tiny little place called Europe. So I have to imagine that there are, that there are extraterrestrials and extra dimensions out there with very, very different kinds of agenda. Some of them come in because they love us and they're trying to raise us up. The angelic beings who try to kind of cohabit in some senses. And then the ones who just see us as resources. And when I thought about this, when I saw your question a few days ago, what are these, you know, darker forces doing? So they're involved, in my opinion, in some kind of what I would describe as a kind of a psychic cannibalism. So they're literally feeding off the energy of human beings. That they're trying to experience 3D density, and they can only do it through a kind of avatars of various kinds. And so we're one of the people that they're doing it with. I think also, as you mentioned, there's internecine warfare going on, and you find this in the scriptures all the time. You mean all these Roman gods and all these Greek gods and the Sumerian gods, you know, and then the Hebrew scriptures, all these other uh, uh, gods, and they're all fighting with each other. So they're either regional divinities or they're tribal divinities. And they co-opt us. We get conscripted into kind of their proxy wars. And a, a, a fourth reason is we're basically some kind of entertainment. It's like somebody. <laughs> put, yeah. That's too funny. I know it's true, yeah. but it's funny. Yeah. You, get, you put two dogs, you know, killing each other and you think that's funny. And then you start laughing and putting bets in it. Or you got two uh, cockfighting, you know, or bullfighting. And you destroy the animal and people are cheering. and Yeah, yeah, go, go, go them. And so in some senses, like we're, we're entertainment for them as we, as we make war on each other. So I think uh, a lot of this, several, several different factors involved. So we're not doing this on our own. You know, we're, we're in some senses pawns in a proxy warfare. We're kinds of um, um, fodder for some kind of psychic cannibalism. At the same time, we're the beneficiaries of angelic light beings who are trying to remind us of our origins, the fact that we're holographic fractals as a source, and that, that our mission is to recapture that, to kind of develop Christ consciousness as individuals, to discover our Buddha nature as a planet, and reascend back up to uh, the, the origin whence we came. I think from my own experience and, and having done you know a lot of plant medicine ceremonies and practices communicating with people on the other side and just a lot of deep inner work for the majority of my life since I was a child, that these practices have given me a level of discernment. I'll give you a good example. When I'm doing a tarot draw, which I do every day, have done for many years, there's days when I have a real clean communication with my soul and the draw comes real easy. But there's also days where I can feel there's other beings coming in and wanting me to pull cards and misdirecting me. And I'm, I, I sometimes will get frustrated. I'm like, oh, what the hell's going on? And so I'll say to my soul, you know, sometimes I say to my soul, okay, who's, who's getting involved in the draw here? Because that's not you guiding me. I can feel it. But you might, I've developed through years of practice and spiritual development the sense the inner sense to know when another force of conscious agent is working through me. And so sometimes my soul will say, well, you know, you got a little bit upset this morning with your wife and, and now you're, you're emotionally charged. And so you're, you're getting fed off by these entities. And so they're hanging around you. So you need to neutralize. So these types of things led me to doing centering practices 
before I do any kind of spiritual work because you 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 know wherever you're at you're you're attractive on that channel right and then other times my soul will say well you know because your heart's open right now and you're communicating with me you're easily accessible by other beings because they see that you're open and communicating with me so the door's open they like to play with us so they jump in the nice thing is like I do a six card draw every day and it breaks my day up so you take 12 hours, say, and divide it by six cards. Each card tells me what the theme of two hours will be. So at the end of each day, I can look back and say, okay, how did this play out? And when the tarot cards are accurate, of course, you can see, oh, there it is. This happened. That correlates exactly with what that card means or what my soul tells me that card means. But then if you have days where it's like, oh, that card's completely wrong, you start becoming tuned to when you're getting misguided. And so for me, tarot becomes a very useful weather vane because I can then correlate the draw with the experience and tell how tuned I was to my soul's guidance. Point being, very few people have a mechanism for their own spiritual growth and development where they have a feedback loop like Absolutely. tarot I'm describing so they just become a head that's very accessible, absolutely. you know, and, and, and that makes for a lot of trouble. And I think that's one of the real problems we have is we don't really have much training by wise people that gives us the ability to discern what's working through us and whether or not that is, whether or not that's favorable for our own spiritual growth and development, our own relationships, our own connection, and our authentic connection to what we think God is from the sense of unconditional love or from that which is moral or that which is ultimately good, beautiful, or true. Um, and so it leaves us very susceptible to addictions, to constant fighting, to believing the thoughts in our head as though they're true when they could be any number of beings thinking through us. And I think that's a bit of a problem that, that we probably need to sort out. And maybe that's part of what you can share with us in the spiritual warrior section when we get to it. My other question is what practical suggestions that we can all use to help bring harmony within ourselves, each other, and contribute to world healing and world peace, knowing that we are open to all these other influences. So, great questions, Paul. So, just a quick comment on what you just said before you ask that final and other question. I totally agree with you that I think spiritual life is like um, it's like a, a journey through a kind of a, a psychic asteroid belt. Yeah, there were literally, you know, there are mines all over the place, and you have to be really, really careful when you travel, attempt to do any kind of spiritual work, that you're not bumping into kind of uh, asteroids that are going to blow you out of the, the, the heavens. Claim level. more mines. So you <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely, exactly. And so, in fact, the um, one of the prayers I make at night before I go to sleep is, uh, um, I am now going to travel in the astral realms. I ask avatars and ascended masters to guide me and to heal me, uh, and allow me to be of service to souls who are in distress. Yeah. Don't get me. Don't get me into shit I can't handle. <laughs> make sure. I don't, yeah. I, don't let me, don't I demand me, yeah. that. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so to kind of get back to the question, then what are some of the practical suggestions? There are three things I recommend constantly if a person is serious about the spiritual journey. The first, the first one is developing uh, a personal cosm cosmology. And I'll kind of uh, explicate those in more detail in a few minutes. The first one is I have to develop a personal cosmology. The second one is that I have to be part of an intentional community of some kind. And the third one is that I have to have regular daily spiritual practice. And you've mentioned a few like the tarot and stuff like that. So let me unpack those piece by piece. So for me, every single one of us is living life driven by some kind of an internalized philosophy of life, but it has been unconsciously acquired. We got it from our parents, from our teachers, from the television, whatever. And so if I say to Michael, Michael, why did you say that? Seemed like the right thing to say. Or Mary, why did you do that? seemed like the appropriate thing to do. What made it the right thing or the appropriate thing was an internalized uh, personal cosmology that I've acquired unconsciously and now I am accessing it unconsciously in any situation. And that's a disaster. I mean, uh, Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. 
And Gautama Siddhartha said, he called himself Buddha, means I am awake. And Jesus Christ said, if the householder knew at what stage the thief was going to break in and steal, he wouldn't go to sleep. Right. The householder wouldn't go to sleep. Yeah, he'd stay, stay vigilant. And so, you know, being fully conscious yeah, and um, then creating a personal cosmology. And one of the things I did in my 14 years in Africa, I lived in very remote areas. So um, some places I had a generator, so I had light during the evening time. But then for the rest of the day, you know, from 6 p.m., I lived right on the equator. From 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., it was completely dark. And so I started examining my own personal cosmology. What I had been taught as an Irishman, you know, and as a as a Roman Catholic and as a priest, and one by one I began to examine the tenets of this and saying, if I'd been born Hindu, and I heard this, would I accept it as truth? If no, I ditched it. Like, do I really believe that there's a man in Rome with a high hat who's infallible? I don't. Do I really believe that if I eat meat on a Friday that I'm going to go to hell? I don't. So I separated out my beliefs that I could accept no matter what religious system I came through, and ones I couldn't that they were peculiar to my own particular brain. So the first thing is to kind of bring to consciousness the cosmology which is presently driving a person's life. What you're describing is exactly what Steiner says we have to do to activate our awareness soul. He says in order to go from the intellectual soul to the awareness soul, we must ask ourselves this question, is it really true? Will God burn me in hell for touching my genitals? Will uh, whatever it is, whatever, just like you just described. Because if we don't examine our own beliefs with an honest desire to, to really look to see if they're true, I mean, when you think about how many people's egos are constructed out of other people's ideas that have never been examined, but here we are just acting them out unconsciously as though they're facts. It You can see how that we get, the, the whole world gets into the trouble that it's in right now. And, and, and people go to war without even questioning these ideas. Like you're That's willing something. to kill somebody. I mean, look, look at what happened in the last three years, how families were broken to pieces and people were fighting and, Oh my God, the video clips were just mind boggling, but, but people were not asking, is it really true? And then doing the work to investigate it. Like for me, I absolutely abhor the idea that some being is po toying with my fucking inner space and wanting me to do shit that isn't really a representation of who I am choose to be, which I can only find in my heart. I can't find that in my head because there's too much of other people's stuff there. To really be with Paul Check, I have to go in my heart and hold that presence of self and really feel something you can't put words to, but you know it's who you really are. And if that isn't what's guiding me, then I immediately get to be very concerned. And then the, one of the first things I start doing is when my life starts getting chaotic, stressful, or, or there's too much fighting going on or, or friction, I always have to say, okay, is who is it that's acting this out right now? And what's the belief that's driving the behavior? And is it really congruent with my highest ideal for myself and for the people that I love? And if it's not, then I have to sit quietly in meditation or at night before I fall asleep and do my review and say, how can I track this back? So this is the source of my conversations with my soul. I take stock of all this at the end of the day or in the morning in the sauna and I sit and I go through this all with my soul and say, okay, what really happened here? And, you know, I had this belief that so-and-so was going to do this and it upset me and what 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 where was my misunderstanding or false expectations so, you know so this really is what i would really call going to the real church and the real god within yourself but that's not where you get told something out of a book that's not where someone else is that's where you have to have an honest relationship with the god in you that i call soul and where you have to get clear on what your dream is for yourself and how you want to 
be in the world, right? And I think we don't have people guiding us on how to do this stuff. So we just get caught in this thing like children in the middle of a crossfire of a bunch of uh, gangsters. Yeah, I agree totally with you about so and some what I said to uh, constantly is that developing a personal cosmology, the first thing is to examine all the previous tenets and to kind of decide what to keep and what to show. Sure. But then uh, developing a new cosmology is predicated, I believe, on the answer to four questions. The first one is who is God mm -hmm. for me? Is God a distant demanding deity or is God the loving source? I have to figure out for myself what does God mean to me? Not what do my church tell me or what the kind of the scriptures even told me. What, what do I mean by God? Secondly, what do I mean when I say Sean, or you say, when you say Paul, who am I? Am I a skin encapsulated ego? Am I a fractal, a holographic fractal of source? Am I a spirit in a space source? How do I define myself? Um, the third one is, who is neighbor? When I say neighbor, what do I mean by neighbor? Do I mean the guy that votes the same way that I vote or kind of thinks as I think? Or what do I mean by neighbor? And the fourth one is, what is my mission? What did I come down here to do? And so it's the answer to these four questions that create kind of the skeleton around which we can then build a personal cosmology. And this personal cosmology, if it's adequate, it should be able to kind of have some kind of an explanation for every single experience I have in my life. ETs, visions, you know, friends, enemies, whatever. If it can't accommodate all of these, it's inadequate. So I have to keep building it. Secondly, if I really, if it's, if it's my own personal cosmology, it should make my heart sink. Yes. It should really, yeah. Thirdly, I have, it should also stretch me out of my comfort zone. You know, force me to kind of examine stuff, beliefs that I had. And uh, it needs to be constantly updated. As I have new experiences, I need to kind of incorporate those into my personal cosmology. And so for me, that's the first of the three, you know, um, personal cosmology, intentional community, and regular practice. So that's what I would say about most people don't have a, a personal cosmology. They've never given time to it. And this is hugely important. The second thing is then is finding uh, our, our creating an intentional community. And it can be, you know, where you actually get to meet, meet physically or it can be in a Zoom session. But a group of people who do two things for me. They should support me in my search and they should challenge me in my belief systems, as I should do for the community. So it's a bilateral agreement that we don't just become a kind of a cult saying, yes, sir, that whoever's in charge of it, but that uh, we're supported in our desire to find out what our mission is and we're challenged in the kind of the temporary kind of uh, cosmologies that, that we come up with. So that would be the second piece. And the third piece then would be regular, disciplined, daily spiritual practice. And you've talked beautifully about, about those. And so you've got to develop spiritual muscle. So whether it's meditation or time spent in nature or consulting the tarot cards or doing plant medicine, you know, or spending time with little children because uh, little kids are great, great, great teachers because they, they, they have imagination, which is very different from fantasy. Fantasy is the ability to make up stuff that's not real. Imagination is the ability to volitionally shift your state of consciousness, enter into different dimensions, encounter different entities and different energies, uh, interact with them and then learn from it and bring that back here to this waking consciousness and cross fertilize it. And kids do that in spades until we kind of send them to school. So, uh, time in nature, time with little children. So, these are some of the spiritual practices. So, these are the three great important things a, a personal cosmology, you know, uh, an intentional community, and regular, disciplined daily practice. And that's the only way that we're going to break out of this mindset of warfare. That's freaking awesome. That's When's your book going to come out that gives us all that? Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm releasing my series uh, titled Spirit Gem, which I cover a lot of that stuff with slightly different words. But I think there's so many people that need this help. We need, you know, as many of us sharing this from different perspectives as possible so that we can, you know, we, we have to create this, you know, consciousness virus, if you will. We have the, the negative mind viruses, but we need some positive ones to counterbalance them. And, you know, this really links itself very much back to Jung's concept of individuation, because what you're really describing is a, is a process of individuation, which is becoming whole unto yourself, which requires that you take responsibility for yourself and that you Take responsibility for your relationship with God versus being in a cult relationship where you're just a programmed robot acting out somebody else's ideas. 
in service to something that ultimately may destroy you yourself as, uh, you know, people that drank the Kool-Aid with Jim Jones found out and many others, right? And Absolutely. You know, I don't know if you remember a few years back, for example, there was some guy who was some kind of a leader type and he took a whole bunch of people, like I don't know how many, 30 or 40 people into a sweat lodge and a bunch of them died. Oi. Oi. Well, anyhow, you must not have heard about that, but... No, it was a big thing on the news and they, you know, the guy that led them in there didn't die, but a lot of people did die. And so people, of course, knowing that I know about sweat lodges, people are asking, well, what do you think about that? And I said, I'll tell you what I think. Anybody that would sit in a sweat lodge and go through heat exhaustion, I said, there's clear symptoms of heat exhaustion. I've been through it myself. You start getting high, you start getting cold shivers all over your body. Your nervous system starts breaking down. I said, anybody that would sit there just because some idiot's telling them to sit there and not get up and say, I've got to get out of here. I'm, I'm having signs of trouble is, is a, a damn fool, you know? And so th there's, there's, there's an example of a lack of individuation and acting like a child and letting this guy be your daddy and you die. What I'm really saying is everything that you've just described really is a process of taking responsibility for yourself, for your spiritual relationships, your personal relationships, your relationships to people, places, things, food, drink, environment. We can't just sit around and wait for, for, for the government to do it or Bill Gates to do it or any of these people. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Have you ever wondered why your blood is red? It's because it's full of oxygen and life force. It's what keeps you going. But what if I could tell you about something else that's red that will add more life force and keep you going? And if you start with a red juice before you have coffee or tea and wait a few minutes, you might find that you either don't need the coffee or the tea or you need less of it. But this time, instead of getting coffee and tea, you got a lot of nutrition and a lot of great stuff for stress management and detoxification. And it's so important. I got Drew Canole. It took me two years to get him to come <laughs> hang out with me and talk about this. I said, Drew, tell me more about your red juice. And he is right here to tell us what is on with your red juice. My kids love it. Everybody I know loves it. Well, I love that we have it for kids. Because yes. when I was a kid, there was this big red dude that would burst through a brick wall and he was like, Oh yeah. And he would feed me a glass of 50 grams of sugar, <laughs> giving most people diabetes, yeah. ADHD, yeah. addiction, obesity, obesity, all the things. Right. Mm. So when we created red, it was, what's the alternative. Mm -hmm. If we could create something that could create lasting stamina, lasting energy. And then we started to look at our ancient ancestors. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Vikings, mm -hmm. the people that were rowing across the oceans, oceans. for days <laughs> yeah. to go to war. Yeah. What were they taking? Well, they were taking rhodiola. Yeah. Rhodiola is in our red juice. Yeah. And then we were like, okay, so out of all the mushrooms, yeah. what's one of the best medicinal mushrooms that can give us long lasting energy? Mm. We found cordyceps. Cordyceps mm. are absolutely amazing. Yes. Not just any cordyceps or rhodiola, glyphosate residue free and organic. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it taste better than the, oh yeah, yeah. you know, how do we make it taste better than that without the sugar? Yeah. We added a little monk fruit. Monk we, fruit's amazing. Yep. And we found the best berries on the planet. Mm. Berries in, in high amounts, which we have in the red juice, actually help increase stem cell creation in your body. Mm. What's better than that for our little ones and for us? Yes. And so many people are just lethargic. They're lacking energy. Yes. What could we do for that? Red juice in the afternoon, 2 p.m. rolls around instead of a nap, instead of the coffee. Drink the red juice. You're going to feel so much better. Well, if you need the nap, take the nap if you can, but then take the red juice to kick you back into gear. Exactly. I love naps and I love coffee. I, I do too, but I love to make sure I got the nutrition in me first. You know, the other thing is berries are a natural stimulant to the adrenal gland. So mm. if people would do a little red juice before they do coffee and tea, they would pick themselves up naturally, except this time they're bringing in nutrition. And unfortunately, coffee blocks almost every vitamin and mineral you can put in your mouth. So Hey, there you have it, right from the man himself. So if you're ready to get filled with life force energy and vitality, go to Organifi.com forward slash check 20. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com forward slash 
C-H-E-K-2-0. And don't forget to use the promo code CHECK20 to get 20% off Organifi Red Juice and all Organifi products. That's Organifi.com forward slash CHECK20 and the discount code is CHECK20. I love uh, Jung's notion of individuation and I think there's a complementary aspect to it as well. And that was illustrated for me very powerfully during my time in Kenya. A lot of what I was involved in was um, water production because I lived uh, literally on the equator. And so water was a huge problem for people. And so over the years, I was involved in many different water projects. I got money from the European Union to kind of finance some of these. And uh, most of them were hugely successful. But there were two dramatic failures, and they became very illustrative to me as a metaphor. And in one of them, we piped water for about two miles into a village, and each project lasts about two years. And so at the end of two years, you know, there was a ceremony turning on of the faucet in the village square, you know, and nothing happened. No water came out. So we traversed the line and some uh, warrior from a different tribe who hadn't gotten a water project had literally just walked along. It's only PVC piping and just jabbed a spear in it like every hundred yards. So the water is sprouting out. So the structures, the pipes are broken. Another one. Uh, we successfully piped water to a village, you know, turned on the faucet. It flowed copiously. Everybody is drinking and dancing. And two days later, everybody is done with that dysentery oh, because yeah. the source was polluted. We didn't realize it was polluted. And for me, that became uh, the the, um, the water are the people who staff the structures are the kind of the agencies. And if you got bad pipes, you can't deliver the product to the consumer. But if you got poisoned water, in good pipes, you're, still, you're going to poison the consumer. So it's the complementarity of individuation where the individuals are kind of committed to their own personal transformation and also the dismantling of old structures and the erection of new ones that are capable uh, agencies or whatever that are actually there working on behalf of people, not on behalf of some kind of an oligarchy. And Jesus put that very perfectly. He says, new wine, new wineskins. If you put uh, new wine into old wine screens, it'll burst the wine skins. And so it becomes very important then that we're committed to our own personal transformation and that we challenge structures and agencies, you know, which are poisoning, poisoning us and we erect uh, better kinds of structures and agencies. So they have to go together. Otherwise, you know, the people are kind of, uh, they won't be effective unless there's some modality for them to visit their kind of uh, their agenda on society. You know, and even with the best structures in the world, if people are not personally committed to kind of um, their own uh, spirituality, they'll just poison the consumers. So it's the kind of complementarity of these two pieces. Yeah, and, and one of the challenges I think we face is, is due to the lack of individuation amongst the public at large. Um, Ken Wilber says in his teachings that about 70% of the world population is still essentially living in the child archetype. So... You know, everything that you're describing is, is, is it's an act of personal agency. We, we, you know, we have to say, what do I stand for and not stand for? We have to say, who are my community? We've got to get involved. We've got to go do this. We've got to, what are my values? Well, you know, what, what is my dream for myself, for my friends, my family, the world? Th these are all things that we have to start with on the inside. And if we don't, ask, is it really true? Then we don't really know who's pumping the poison water, who's pumping the clean water, or who's, we can take that concept right through the last three years and say, you know, is it coming in clean or is it poison? And so, you know, and we can look at the food supply. Is it clean or is it poison? Is the air clean or is it poison? Are chemtrails for good or not good? If you just lay down and watch TV and play another video game, but you don't ask these questions and do some work to find the answers, then you're still a child. You're not a, you're not a warrior for the good. And, and I think we all have to take that responsibility. And even though there's not that many that are individuated, I think those of us that have individuated have the responsibility of emulating to others what it looks like to think for yourself. What does it look like to ask big questions? What does it look like to have a dream? What does it look like to participate in your life? What does it look like to confront your own inadequacies and do the work of asking yourself, how can I be a better person tomorrow? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's quite a journey we're all on. I mean, in many ways, all the shit that's going on in the world is, is, 
paradoxically just the bonfire we need to get people off the couch. Don't you think? So that's a beautiful image. So in Ireland of my youth, there were literally homes in Ireland where the fire hadn't gone out for over 300 years. So what would happen is we used turf for what's called here peat. So that's the, the fires that were built. And um, at, at, um, at nighttime, the mother was always the last person to go to sleep at night. And so she'd go to the fire and she'd cover over the, the embers with the, glowing, with the ashes to protect it uh, during the night. And then she'd be the first person up in the morning and she'd rake away the ashes and the glowing embers would still be there and she'd put more, more peat on it. So literally, the fire hadn't gone out for several hundred years in some of these homes. That's amazing. I remember you mentioned that in a previous podcast. And so for me, what that represents is the glowing embers are the mystical core, you know, our identity as a bite-sized pieces of God. But it, it, gets, it gets covered over by materialistic science and fundamentalist religion. And so it needs some kind of mystics to come back out and rake away the ashes, unearth the embers, and put some fresh turf on it. And that's the function of you know, people who are coming awake, people who are waking up the 30%, as, as, as Wilbur uh, might say, that there have been mystics in every age who've managed to keep the embers alive and they've keep them alive for some generation that will be able to kind of put enough turf on it to to create a, a an, an inferno that will burn away all the kind of all the evil and all the darkness and all the kind of uh, uh, cowardice in us and uh, unleash our souls. And so I see that that that's the um, that's the mission of the light workers, you know, to blow upon those embers and to add fuel to create a, a tsunami in some sense, if you don't mind me mixing my metaphors, of a tsunami of spirit. Yeah. I agree totally with that. I think that's a great source of inspiration for all of us listening that are awake because it really shows how important it is to share your love and to not be afraid to express your truth, not necessarily to make others wrong, but to Say, so here's, here's a viewpoint you can explore. It's just like when you watch a movie. Most good movies are archetypally based and there's a myth inside of them, right? There's a story inside of a story. If you like The Lion King, but your friend doesn't, the first thing I want to know is, well, what didn't you like about it? Okay. And, and oftentimes what you find is your friend wasn't getting the myth. He was just looking at the superficial thing. So I, then I say to my friend, well, how about if you look at the story from this perspective? And oftentimes it's like, oh, I, well, I didn't even realize that. And so those of us that can see, you know, a good example of this, which I know you'll appreciate, in my library, I've got a very interesting book. It's a book that's a collection of all the letters written to Jung by all the people wow. that absolutely disagreed with him. <laughs> right? And most of them are Christian preachers and pastors and theologians, right? And here, here I am, a guy that studies Jung, and he's one of my spirit guides. I go talk to him and ask him questions, and I read these letters, and every one of them, I go, not one single one of these people did the work to either understand him or even ask him what he meant before they started throwing bombs at him. Absolutely. You know, and I'm looking at this going, Jesus Murphy, this is really the nature of the problems. These people will sit and write long, complicated, nasty letters without even doing the work to say, well, what does Jung really mean when he uses the word individuation? Instead, they just plug what they want in there, you know, and, and, and that doesn't help anybody. And Unfortunately, our, our education systems don't teach us how to think. They teach us just to believe. <laughs> and so, and that's because it's not education. When you look at the Latin, educatio means to lead out from inside of. Mm. So it's about helping kids to kind of um, articulate their inner wisdom. And what we do instead, we treat them as empty vessels to be filled up with factoids. So it's not education. It may be schooling, but it's not education. What I want to do now is talk to you about, you know, we've, we've got a good start on this because you've just gave us some real key things like having your own personal cosmology, which to, in my language is your own personal myth. And, you know, looking carefully at the four functions of a myth that Joseph Campbell lays out, does it, does it give you a sense of the magic and the mystery of awe of life? Does it 
keep two of the functions of myth are almost the same, keeping the magic mystery and awe of life. Uh, the other one is, does it teach you the proprietaries and improprietaries or the rights and wrongs of your people? And does it teach you how to engage an enemy so you know, you know, when do you kill or not kill? What what is the rules of capture so that you're not being inhumane? Otherwise, you 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 just invite more trouble. You know, as Lao Tzu says, your enemy builds a bigger weapon, and then you build a bigger weapon. Then they build one, and that goes on until the world is destroyed. And then the myth has to carry you through the stages of life, from birth through the childhood to adulthood to maturation, and then you have to be able to understand in your own mythology what does death mean to you and how, how are you going to confront that. And so my point for bringing this up is that what you're calling a personal cosmology really should include these key factors or you're going to have an empty spot in your cosmology and probably are only going to be looking into it when, when, you know, when the house is burning down metaphorically, which is a really bad time to expand your cosmology. You shared with me outlines for a number of the lectures or, or sermons that you give to your followers, and I looked through and my soul guided me to your series of talks on becoming a spiritual warrior, the why and the how. Now, I think you had four parts to that, but look, we're, we're dealing with a lot of issues. We got the globalists, the World Economic Forum, the World Health, <laughs> the World Not Health Organization, big tech, global media, military industrial complex, uh, three-letter organizations, deep state. We've got the hijacking of God and Jesus by these religious and various institutions to manipulate people's minds. We've got the destruction of culture and family unit. We've got the degradation and destruction of human rights and, and things like our own constitution. Our natural resources are being hijacked. We've got globalists trying to categorize them all and, and, and turn them into stocks and commodities. The atmosphere is being destroyed by chemtrails and chemicals and all this stuff in the name of global warming. Uh, you know, these are things that can trigger a lot of fear in people. And I can even find myself, Sean, as an ex-paratrooper, having a real spiritual crisis because there's a part of me that wants to go out and confront these people even if I have to use force because the young man in me was trained to deal with things that way. So I have to watch that part of me and say, wait a minute, if I start doing that, I'm doing the exact same shit they're doing. I might, I might be able to justify it with my own ideology, but at the end of the day, that's no different than just building a bigger weapon and it just leads to more weapons. You know, one of the inspirations for me has always been Mahatma Gandhi because having studied his life, and his philosophy and seeing how he pretty much orchestrated the taking back of his country from the British non-violently, I know what's possible. I think Gandhi is a phenomenal example of a spiritual warrior. And, and you know, I, I love you because you, you're an older man. You're older than me. I'm 62, but you're in your 70s. You've lived more life than I have. You've probably studied more than I have, which is hard for most people to do, but I believe you have. Um, you know, you, you look, if I was in trouble, you're one of the first people I would call for counseling because I trust your wisdom more than I trust. I, I know where the edge of mine is. So I have to say, okay, who do I reach to that can, that's got more depth than I do? And that's why I wanted to have you always have you on the podcast is because I too need guidance. So I find the edges of myself and go, what do I do? How do I handle this? And the world's at a point right now where we've got to know how to handle these, these types of threats because they're fucking real. With that preface, I'm, I'm going to ask you, how do we become spiritual warriors in the situation that we're all in right now and do it in such a way that we can still protect our children, protect our our, our constitutional rights as citizens, our sovereignty, but not end up falling to, into the very trap that we're being led into in many ways? That's brilliant questions, Paul. So uh, way back to 2022, I had a dream one night um, that I wrote down and I called it the uh, Lightworkers Manifesto. And I just, 
I printed out a copy. It's very short. There's only a few paragraphs. I'd like to read it to get an, as an introduction to respond. Yeah. I wrote it in September of 2022. We are in a battle for the soul of the planet. And so God is sending in the warriors and light bringers whose mission is to take education away from the child molesters, to take economics away from the banksters, to take healing away from big pharma, to take storytelling away from the mass media, to take entertainment away from Hollywood, to take food production away from agribusiness, to take fire away from the military industrial complex, to take democracy away from politicians, and to take spirituality away from Mecca and from Rome. So in some senses, that's kind of when I call it a light workers manifesto. So it gives me a kind of a template to look at what are the various components of the issues we face right now and what, what must our response to these things be? And so I had this really interesting dream. And in the dream, I was in a Protestant church. And I was listening to a young pastor giving a very, very powerful uh, homily. But a lot of his congregation were really upset with him. You know, he was really pushing the edges. And I really, really agreed with what he had to say. So at the end of the service, I went around to the back of the church in order to congratulate him. And he came out the back and he said, hi, uh, my name is Sean. I really want to congratulate you on the courage you displayed and kind of the perspicacity of the, you know, your understanding of the issues, you know. And then I wanted to say, I, uh, I'm the spiritual director for a small group called, and for the life of me, I couldn't think of Companions on the Journey, which is the group that we formed 27 years. I couldn't think of the name. And so I found myself saying, uh, I'm the spiritual director for a small group called Warriors on the Way. And that's, that's how the title was born. So I came back to my congregation. I said, okay, you know, here's where I'm going you know, for the next uh, period of my life, you know, in, into, into warriorhood. And so I've been uh, working with that notion. And then about a year ago, I contacted 12 different women in different parts of the world. I wanted a great-grandmother. I wanted grandmothers. I wanted mothers. I wanted single women. I wanted unmarried women. I wanted people from different countries. And uh, we put together a band of uh, 12 women. And I called it Mama Bears and Women women Warriors. And I met with them on two occasions and then said, you're on your own at this stage now. They're meeting once a month. And their mandate is to kind of uh, examine the current forms of child abuse, you know, uh, uh, child trafficking, uh, mandated kind of medical procedures, uh, having drag queens in kindergarten, these kinds of things, to identify what are the... Uh, what are the various forms of child abuse that are happening right now? And as mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, what do you need to do about that? So I'm trying to ignite, you know, different groups to, uh, to deal uh, with, with what's going on there. Hello, my friends and fellow world workers. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. I'm happy to announce that the Czech Academy enrollment is now open. We are limited to 100 spaces for this next intake, so apply early. If you would like a preview of what you will learn in the Czech Academy, I've got great news. The Open House is back. It's free for you to take a sneak peek at the Czech Academy e-learning platform, where you'll be able to take select lessons from our online courses, including Integrated Movement Science 1, Online, and HLC2, that's Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 2 Online, Preview our Academy-exclusive online workshops. Check out our Academy business assets, such as package templates and client onboarding checklists, and more. If you're ready to master yourself and share your love and wisdom in the world and help others get healthy and live their dreams, go to chek.group forward slash open house L number 4D. That's check dot group forward slash open house l the number four d it's not case sensitive there has never been a better more important time for a career in holistic health and i'm excited to be able to join you and support you in living your dreams yeah it's interesting that you mentioned gandhi um and you know what happens when the kind of the pressure comes on whether it's you know, mandated um, medical procedures, you know, or shutdowns or whatever it is, what happens? And uh, what happens, in my opinion, is that uh, they say that Gandhi had a tremendous devotion to uh, a divinity called Rama, or sometimes called Ram. And Ram is the kind of the, uh, the God that um, embodies chivalry and virtue. And he would repeat this mantra again and again and again and again in his life. And when he was shot, 
think it was January 1948, and a Brahmin came up, bowed to him twice, and then shot, and then shot him twice in the stomach and once in the head. And the only thing that Gandhi said was, Ram, Ram, Ram. So it's like he had programmed himself that this was his default position, that, you know, when it really went down, this is what he, how he would, he would exit. And so it becomes really, really important then that we have some kind of a default position. So the very last thing I said before I go to sleep at night, I created this mantra about four or five years ago. And so I say to myself, I say, I am love residing in the sacred heart of my heavenly father. I am light residing in the sacred heart of Mother Mary. I am Logos residing in the sacred heart of Jesus. I am life residing in the sacred heart of the Holy Spirit. And I am laughter residing in the sacred hearts of the awakened ones. And so I want to say, I'm going to go to sleep. And this is my kind of mindset as I travel. And I'll, I'll repeat this many times during the day. But I have to have some kind of a default identity so that, you know, when the shit hits the fan in any situation, whether it's uh, personal relationships or international situations, that I have a, a default position that I'm going to go back to. Now, anybody who doesn't have an internal kind of sense of their own divinity and the divinity of anybody else, their default position is always going to be cowardice and self-concern. The people who are awake, their default position is always going to be courage and compassion. So it becomes really, really important then that we train ourselves, that our, our personal identity and our personal mission is so real to us that it becomes our default, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. That's the kind of the touchstone about how we are to move. And so when I think then of what do we do with the situation in which we find ourselves now, I think that there are four kinds of compassion. I call them the four C's. The first level of compassion is confirmation. At a boy, Paul, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. So confirmation. Thank you. <laughs> the, yeah, great. Yeah, and I mean that to you particularly. The second one is cooperation. We're members of a team, and so each of us has a function in the team, and so we're we're compassionate in the sense that we're cooperating with each other in a joint project. The third one is compensation. Somebody drops the ball, you know, and it's going to be kind of a, a, a turnover or kind of an interception, whatever you call it, in American football. And so you, you run in, you grab it, and you hold it onto it for our side. So compensation is a third form of compassion. And the fourth form of compassion is confrontation. Sometimes you've got to call this shit out. And Jesus yeah. was really, really expert at that. Now, you can do it with passion, but you can't do it with anger. There's a huge difference. Passion is you've got to put all of your energy and all of your truth to the situation. And he did it constantly when he met situations like that. And so faced with those kinds of situations, we have to be compassionate in all four senses of the word. And in some instances, it is more important to be confrontational than to be confirmatory. And so just figuring out what is what. So many months ago, I, had a, I listened to my dreams a lot as well as you do. And I often I seed my dreams. Before I got to bed, I say, you know, I want some kind of input on this particular issue when I'm dreaming. And I had the, the question I said to myself was, I want to distinguish between sin and evil. And I woke up about four o'clock in the morning and I, I got at that. I was told sin is the individual transgression of a culturally created precept. You know, you know, I ate meat on a Friday or I did 45 miles an hour in a 30 mile zone or whatever. So sin is the individual transgression of a culturally created precept. You know, it's only coming from human beings. Human beings made this stuff up. Whereas evil is a cosmic conspiracy using human intermediaries to separate souls from source. So it's a huge difference. Literally, as we talked about ETs, whatever, this has cosmic dimensions and has human intermediaries. And when I look at groups like the WHO and the WEF, you know, and kind of the, uh, the media and our, our, our medicine and our three-letter agencies, there are human institutions, you know, uh, it seems to me, that are intermediaries for this cosmic agenda. And we're destroying gender, we're destroying children, we're destroying marriage, we're destroying family, we're destroying spirituality, and ultimately they're trying to, dis uh, to destroy God. So I see that we're at a trifurcation point in human evolution. And I got this out of vision down at the creek some many years ago. Uh, three parts. Homo sapiens sapiens are divided into three parts. The first part I call Homo sociopathicus, the tyrants who want to control us as resources. The second one is Homo artificialis, the robotic humans that are attending uh, the, the, the transhuman agenda. And the, 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 the third one is Homo spiritualis, 
people who are awake and are dedicated uh, to the spiritual mission. And so for me then, uh, that's the, uh, that is the response to the world in which we, we, we live now. That we have to realize, I have to decide which group am I going to belong to. Am I going to be part of the, the, the oligarchical tyrants who are just grabbing resources? Am I going to be the sighted masses who say, yeah, give me as many injections as you want, you know, you know, and I'll wear a mask, and you know, I won't go out of doors, and I'll socially distance, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Or am I going to be awake and stand up and confront what's happening right now? And so that for me is kind of, that's the kind of the, uh, the, light, bringer, the light bringers manifesto that I'm trying to uh, promote uh, for my community and for myself. That's very beautiful. Uh, the, the confrontation part is where it takes a fair bit of self-control and wisdom to manage. You know, you're a mature man, so you have a lot of practice at dealing with confrontation and skills for dealing with confrontation that a lot of us don't have. But one of the best little books that I'd like to recommend to everybody, and I actually have a podcast with the author of the book, is Nonviolent Communication, The Basics as I Know and Use Them by Wayland Myers. Oh, okay. And, and so for those of you that haven't listened to my podcast with Wayland Myers, it goes through a lot of the basics. But this is a little pocket book that carries the key teachings of Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication, which is really quite a transition for most of us. But I like this little book more than I write, like Marshall Rosenberg's most popular book because it gives you the key pieces Brilliant. that we can all use. And one of the things that, that I've learned and that I have to keep reminding myself to practice, when we're in a confrontation, our tendency is to, to judge and say, you did this or you did that or you shouldn't be doing this. or you know. So we, we, we're right away cutting ourselves off from the other person and turning them into an object, which makes it easier for us to attack and forget that they're part of us spiritually. In Waylon Myers' book, one of the things that he says is that when we're in a situation like this, that what we should share is what our wants, feelings, and or our needs are. In other words, um, not, you're wrong about such and such. What I'm really wanting right now is to share my feelings. Or what I'm feeling right now is very sad and very angry because you're imposing your viewpoints on me and I feel objectified, I don't feel like you care for me as a human being. Or what I'm really needing is to be able to hear you from my heart, but I'm not able to do that for whatever reason it is. The other thing that he says is, we need to make a specific request. If you just argue and shout, we don't have a specific, we don't have a way to direct the flow of energy in the conversation. So for example, my specific request for you is, what would you do if someone came to you and tried to force you to do something with your children that went completely against your beliefs, your way of living, and your values. How would you handle that? Like, I'd like to ask that to Bill Gates, personally. <laughs> I really would. I'd like to say, what exactly would you do with all your money and all the Navy SEALs that protect you? Would you just stand there and let it happen? Like you want the rest of us to do? How would you handle that, Mr. Gates? So wants, feelings, needs, make a specific request, and then repeat and reinforce. So Sean, what I've just heard you say is, and I say it back to you, and you either give me an acknowledgement, yes, that's what I said, or you say, well, not quite, Paul. The, what I really said to you is this, and then I repeat it back to you. Okay, so, so then you know I've heard you, and I know that I've heard what you wanted me to hear. So wants, feelings, needs, make a specific request, repeat and reinforce. And the other thing is, Marshall Rosenberg, very clear, all judgments are tragic expressions of unmet needs. And so one of the things I learned from nonviolent communication is the difference between a judgment and an observation. Yes, if you make exactly. a judgment, you're a real asshole. I wish you'd fuck off because I don't want anything that you're talking about in my life versus I observe that your way of living is very different than mine. And I'm really wanting the freedom to have my own rights to live the way I want to live, at least in my own house, on my own land, and within the, within the confines of the Constitution of the United States. And I'm feeling as though you're infringing upon my, my God-given rights. Is there a way that you can get what you want and I can get what I naturally deserve so that we don't have to have this conflict with each other? So the difference is, 
A judgment cuts you off, but an observation is stating what you see or what the behavior is or, or what's happening, but without cutting yourself off from the other individual. Um, and I'm sharing those with you. I know you probably know these things, but I think, don't you think that these are important tools to have in our toolbox as we go into what we're going into very deeply in the world right now? Absolutely. So uh, I, I've read Marshall's book as well, Nonviolent Communication, and I, I do a lot of couples counseling. And uh, so I, I have a, a kind of a very simple a kind of an example that I use with couples. I say, suppose you two guys are driving in the car together. Let's say the, uh, the husband is driving and the wife is the passenger. And he's driving at 95 miles an hour. And the wife says to him, you're driving like a bloody madman. Now, that's a judgment. You know, if I say, you know, you're, you're, ju you're driving at 95 miles an hour, that's an observation. He can check the speedometer. I can check it. It's 95 miles an hour. So it's not a judgment or an attack. It's an observation of a fact. The second thing is, you know, what, what, what do you want? What do you need? I need to be able to kind of, uh, what am I feeling right now? I feel really scared traveling at 95 miles an hour. I'm not saying you're an asshole, you know, and you're making me scared. Because now I'm making you responsible for how I'm feeling. I'm saying, I feel really scared traveling at 95 miles an hour. What do I need? I, I need to be able to relax, you know, and enjoy the journey. That's my, my need. So what's my specific measurable request? Could you please get the needle down to 65? Now we can both see whether he's going to do it or he's going to put up to 105. And so for me, that's just a, a kind of a simplistic example that I use when I'm teaching NVC uh, to, uh, to couples. But what I've come across, uh, attending a few... Um, uh, powwows, Native American Indian powwows years ago, there were four rules to a powwow that I use a lot in couples counseling. And I advocate to them. And the four rules of a powwow are uh, show up, pay attention, speak your truth without judging, attacking, or blaming, and do not be attached to the outcome. They are the four rules of a powwow. And so uh, I use that as well as a kind of a, a communication technique to people. You know, And uh, I, I actually created a list of 10 tips for good communication, and I created a test, a very simple test, a paper and pencil test, where each of the two people can evaluate their own ability at each of the 10 and their partners, and then compare them and see, you know, are they at, do they have a completely different idea of their own, you know, communication ability? And then we use that as a template to deal with the issues which are problematic for them. And so I, I totally agree with you. Communication is vital, you know, a minor issue, if we don't know how to communicate, becomes a major problem. You know, so it's really important then how we how we communicate with each other, and that's very true, as you point out, not just in kinds of uh, in, in, in in marriages, but uh, and, and nationally and internationally as well. Now, the last one on the four uh, characteristics of the powwow is not be attached to the outcome. That's quite hard to do. Because if you, if you didn't have some level of attachment, you wouldn't be bringing something up in the first place. I would, I would have a hard time looking you in the eyes and saying, I'm not attached to the outcome of what's, not go of what's going on in the world right now. But the, the outcome is the result of the conversation. I don't mean the outcome as a, some distant possibility. I'm saying as a result of our dialogue today, I'm not going to be, I'd be attached to the kind of viewpoint I came in with because if there are two intelligent people talking about any issue, there must be some value on both sides. And so I'm far better served learning from you the part I didn't know than imposing on you the part I previously did know. Okay, that's the clarification I needed because, because it can become almost, well, you know, Luciferian in the fact that, oh, just get out of here and forget about it all. Go in your cave and it's all Maya. You know, that's not attached to the outcome. And, you know, and this is why Kabir said, look, hiding in caves and meditating is not real spiritual development. Any idiot can do that. If you want to grow spiritually, get married, get a job and have some kids, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then you're in the game, baby. I think the, the real distinction there is that we're not attached to the outcome to the degree we, we, we realize we're having an honest communication with someone. Therefore, we have to let go for something new to emerge, there has to be, we have to make room for the transcendent function. Absolutely. Right. Something's going to rise out of it. So there's going to be an emergent property. But if we have too much attachment to the outcome, we can't let that, that emergent property make itself present for us. Very important. Right. If, I, if I'm Very too important. fixated on my own beliefs, I'll never be able to see where yours could grow me. Yes, exactly.
exactly. So in, in one, some ways, you know, the fool thinks nobody can teach him anything, and the wise man knows that everybody can teach him something. So there's no conversation from which I can't learn or can't grow if I have the proper attitude. Yeah. yeah, it's like when you're a parent. If you don't think you're going to learn from your kids, then you're a damn <laughs> fool. And you're going to ruin your kids. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, this is these are like such critical, important concepts right now. I mean, more probably than ever. I mean, yeah, people that lived through the First World War would have thought the world was coming to an end. People living through the Second World War would have thought the world was coming to an end. And for some, for many, it did. But we're, we're dealing with much bigger issues than either the First or Second World War because we, we now have a planet that's dying. We, we have ecosystems dying all around. We, we, have, we, we have, a you know, morality is bleeding to death. Virtue is being swept under the carpet. It's been demonized. It's yeah. It's not being swept under the carpet, it's being demonized. The good guys are the bad guys, and virtue is vice, and vice is virtue. Yes, and, and we have an agency called the CIA who stated publicly that our job will be done when nobody knows what the truth is, and we're here we are living. You know, what kind of an agency devotes itself to diluting the truth to the point that nobody knows what it is, yet that's supposed to be an agency designed to protect the United States? So we can see that this disease has been... Um, festering in the bowels of this nation and many nations worldwide because the CIA paradoxically is not supposed to work within the United States. It's supposed to work outside of the United States, but it's not. My point is that we're in a situation now that's even worse than the first two world wars because it's threatening the very survival of the planet. You know, those those last wars were were, were except for the not, you know, the atomic bomb in, in Hiroshima, they were fairly survivable. But now we're, we're, we're pushing the red line on every single system, including our future generations. Because if we don't be really on top of the game right here, the kids that are going to be running the country in 25 years are going to be completely, utterly lost. They're not going to have any moral compass whatsoever. They're going to be dangerously close to being robots programmed by agencies that, that they have no conscious awareness of, which makes them really zombies and uh, in many senses of the word. This is why I want to have you on the podcast, and I, and I want to have you on the podcast many more times. Not only do I need your guidance, but we, we need somebody like you to help us step into this a little bit at a time, because it's very hard to take what you and I have just shared and just say, okay, I listened to this podcast and I'm going to go get my cosmology and I'm going to do the practice of the powwow and I'm going to practice nonviolent communication because we're working against, you know, hundreds of years of social programming. So, you know, to get something from the ego to the heart and from idea to practice really takes some support. It's like being a martial artist. You, 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 you have to go through a lot of basic training to get to where you can do it when your head's hurting and your brain's fried because you got whacked in the head so hard you're seeing stars. And that's why as a, as a boxer, we would practice hundreds of rounds of the most basic stuff, the same stuff you start in your first day of boxing. Here I am on the one of the best boxing teams in the world, and we're spending an hour to an hour and a half a day going jab, jab, one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, and everybody gets bored as hell. When I was a paratrooper, they made us practice jumping out of airplane shells over and over and over and over again, repeating the commands so that when you're in a battlefield situation, you know what to do without thinking exactly. about it. And so it takes time for us and, you know, Gandhi worked with people constantly. He was telling everyone, don't do this. Don't get angry. Even if you get beat up, don't fight back. You know, you got to. So we, we have to step into these things, which at the end, I want to make sure, you know, we, you tell people how to find your sermons and the things that you offer, because I think it's very, very important for people to, to know where they can get more access to your teachings and your guidance. 
Uh, you were going to say something there. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'm agreeing with you completely. So um, you were developing this muscle memory as a boxer, as a paratrooper, as a, you know, a, a parachutist you have again and again and again. And what we need to do is kind of develop kind of a spirit muscle, you know, by these kinds of practices so that our default position always becomes courage and uh, compassion rather than cowardice and kind of self-concern. And as you say, that you only get that by practice, 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 practice. So the idea that, uh, you know, that uh, a person can go to church on a, on a Sunday and they fulfill like their spiritual uh, program for the week, that's not going to make spiritual people out of you. And it's certainly not going to, it will not be your default position, you know, when the shit hits the fan. Right. The, the note I wrote is that we must practice with and within ourselves because that we'll call it war, is going on 24-7. I Absolutely. mean, there's so much shit running through any of our heads and so much programming that I think we don't need to wait for a confrontation to say, okay, now I got to pull out my rules that Sean gave me here. What do I do? It's too late. But but if we if we just engage the turmoil within ourselves, the fears, the insecurities, the self-judgments, the fixations, the neuroticism. Always ask yourself, what is my dream for who I choose to be? What is my cosmology or my myth? What is best for everybody involved right now? What are the, what are the choices available to both sides or both sides of myself on the inside? There's one that says, go get stoned. And the other one that says, you haven't finished your work for the day yet. <laughs> right? Like, you you know, I tried to do that in my Lucifer Christ Aramon podcast at the end there where the last hour and a half, yeah. I remember where I took the, I said, okay, you want to lose weight. Here's what Lucifer has to say about it. Here's what Aramon has said. And here's what, here's what the Christ principle says about it. So there's examples of how I try to work inside of myself and say, well, how can I use the, the, these forces? The forces of Aramon is to be materialistic, to have, to lie, to take shortcuts. The force of Lucifer is to create illusions, to get what you want. And who gives a fuck about anybody else? Cause you're just going to get out of Dodge anyhow. And then there's that Christ consciousness, which says, you know, what's best for everybody involved, you know, or the Tao principle, not too much, not too little, a little bit of marijuana and a little bit of work makes for a happy guy, too much pot, not enough work. Um, your landlord will have something to say to you at the end of the month, you know, like goodbye, motherfucker. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, Jesus. But the point I'm making is when you agree that we can all practice right inside of ourselves, because I really feel there's this is the first temple we're walking around in, we're breathing in, we're feeding, we're living. And you know, to thine own self be true, or thou canst be true to any other man. I think if we get our own temple straight, we live our values and our principles and our practices in ourselves, then we're ready to engage with others. And then we're also practicing, you know, I teach I, we all. First, take care of yourself, master yourself, so that you have something to share with someone else. Then practice in relationship, and then you know how to deal with the all and what you're here to give to the all. If you always orient yourself to everybody else's stuff, then you lose yourself. You don't know who you are. And if you're always doing stuff for the world, but you can't manage yourself or relationships, then you really don't know what you're doing in the world. And you're probably already a pawn for somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. There's an old Latin, an old Latin proverb that says, Nemo dat quad non habet. Nobody can give what they don't have. So if you're not doing your inner work, yeah, there's nothing available that you can give to anybody else. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me bragging about Paleo Valley over the years of listening to my podcast, and there's a very good reason for that. Not only do I love the genius of Autumn Smith, a holistic nutritionist, but her products are phenomenally good. My kids love them. I love them, and we all use them every day. My students love them. My clients love them, and they are absolutely top notch. One of my kids' favorite snacks is Paleo Valley's bone broth, in chocolate. They love to make their hot chocolate drink themselves simply by whisking up collagen-rich protein powder in a mug of hot water. And I'm happy to let them indulge as I know it is packed full of great nutrition for them in the disguise of a sweet treat. Even us big kids love our sweet treats. And isn't it great when we can enjoy something that not only tastes great, but is truly great for us? Paleo Valley's 100% 
Grass-fed bone broth protein is the only of its kind made from truly grass-fed cows raised on pesticide-free grass pastures. It's made from bones, not hides, slowly simmered to extract the proteins and nutrients. Gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and dairy-free, the chocolate mix includes organic coconut milk powder, organic cacao bean, organic monk fruit that makes a sweet, creamy, delicious drink that my kids, family, and friends just can't get enough of. You can also add to smoothies, use it in baking, or mix it with your coffee for a healthy mocha treat. Paleo Valley's bone broth protein is also available in vanilla and unflavored. To try Paleo Valley's excellent bone broth protein and save 15% on your purchase, go to paleovalley.com forward slash lowercase c-h-e-k 15. No promo is required. That's P-A-L-E-O. V-A-L-L-E-Y dot com forward slash C-H-E-K 15 to get your 15% discount as a Living 4D listener. No promo code is required. And I promise you, not only will you love this stuff, your kids will love it. You can giggle and laugh because they think they're getting a sweet dessert right before bed, but they will love it and sleep great. And boy, do we parents love it when our kids sleep great. Enjoy Paleo Valley's amazing products. Now, my next question is, being as honest as you realistically realistically can be, what do you predict we are going to go through between now and 2030? I mean, if I said to you, Coach, you, uh, you've played against this team many times in your career. What can we expect for the last quarter of the game? What do we need to get ready for? You know, what do you see realistically on the play board here? That's a great image. Uh, I don't have a tele- I've never owned a television set in my life. So I've only seen about four uh, NFL games. But one of them was a few years ago. A friend of mine invited me to his house uh, for the uh, Super Bowl. It was the New England Patriots, Tom Brady, and I think the, uh, the Falcons, if I remember correctly. And uh, he's telling me that this, this is a great local guy, Tom Brady. In fact, his mother used to come to Mass where I was occasionally. You know, he's now playing with the New England Patriots. And he's a, he's a wonder, wonder, wonder quarterback. So. We get to halftime, and the uh, the Patriots are down uh, twenty-one to three. They're eighteen points adrift, and the commentators say no team has ever come back in a Super Bowl who is more than who is more than ten points down. The so second half starts, and the Falcons get another touchdown. So now it's twenty-eight to three. They're twenty-five points down, and Tom Brady hasn't done diddly squat. And then Tom Brady came alive, and by the end of uh, real time, it was twenty-eight twenty-eight. And it was the wow. first Super Bowl ever to go into overtime. And uh, the Patriots won it by uh, the 34 to 28. And wow. for me, that became this extraordinary image, you know, that never give up. You know, the best games to win are the ones you, it seems like almost inevitable that you're going to lose. And if I were to look now at, you know, we're in the last quarter in some senses, if you say 2030, and we're way, way down, you know, the Falcons are beating the crap out of us. But yeah. there's, a Tom, there's a Tom Brady in every single one of us. And there's a Tom Brady in the soul of the planet. And therefore, I have no doubt whatsoever that we can turn around and win this game. And so um, it, it depends on, you know, what our kind of uh, our, our, our image of ourselves is and what our image of our mission is. You know, God doesn't send us to do a task for which we're not equipped, that there's, yeah, we always have the resources we need. And so... Um, I want to maybe talk about the image of a, a, a caterpillar, this kind of ugly little creature who takes forever to go nowhere. Because in a sense, <laughs> nowhere is where the present moment always is. If you take the word nowhere and split it, it means now here. But at some stage, it goes into a cocoon. It becomes this kind of a goo, this kind of a terrible goo. And, and then it releases imaginal cells that create a butterfly out of it. It feels to me like we're caterpillars walking ourselves into a cocoon right now. But if we can release the imaginal cells, then what's going to emerge is a butterfly. But we have to believe in it. We have to have the ability to uh, imagine a different kind of a, a different kind of an outlet. And so I believe, uh, I don't want to put an actual date in it, although I know that 2030 is a significant date when you're looking at the kind of the agenda of the WHO and the WEF and people like that. And they have a definite agenda for that. And they may well be able to kind of promote that agenda for several more years. But ultimately, I do not believe that darkness ever overcomes light. A single candle can dispense light to a huge auditorium. You know, no amount of darkness can quench a candle. 
And so I have to believe that the light of God and the light of the divine within each one of us will find the uh, the way and the and the courage and the kind of the uh, the methodology, you know, of of shining light into the darkness of our times and the darkness of our uh, and the tyrannical oligarchy who are trying to oppress us. So I have to believe that if not by 2030, at, at some stage the light uh, will win out. And that Tom Brady will throw the winning touchdown with 10 seconds to go. Good. So if I could ask you. Could you give us just maybe the one, two, three, four approach to how we can start together as individuals and as friends and people that share values? Step one, step two, step three, step four to being an effective spiritual warrior right now so that we can say, okay, the first thing I'm going to do after I get off this podcast is I'm going to practice this. Once that's done or in parallel, I'm going to do this. You know, Jung said, never give people more than four things to do because they won't remember it. He did a lot of research on that. He said, as soon as you give people five things, their mind can't hold it. <laughs> and so I built a four doctor system because of what Jung taught me, knowing that the fifth doctor would be the one that confused everybody. <laughs> but the paradox of the four doctors is, you know, if you look at, in my system, you got, I use a system of alchemy I developed. I'd love to show it with you someday. It's called Check Life Process Alchemy. But in the West, you have Dr. Happiness, which is air, element, mind. In the North, you have Dr. Movement, which is the fire element, summer. In the East, uh, you have the fall, Dr. Diet. Then that's the earth element. And then down below, at the bottom, you have the water element, you have winter, and you have Dr. Quiet, which is rest and introspection. And so I organized the whole system of my alchemy and my coaching and therapy so that whenever I'm working with someone, we start with Dr. Happiness, we get clear on what our dream is and what's happy making for us so we don't forget how to be happy and rely on drugs and external sources and codependencies then we set values for how much movement do we need, how, what quality of food, and how are we going to eat for our individual needs, and how are we going to rest and where are we going to have introspection and a spiritual practice. I keep it to those four. So if we kind of modeled something like that for our spiritual warrior practices, could you give us the four steps that you would practice or that you would suggest we practice so that we can walk away from the podcast with a simple one, two, three, four approach. You're right. So I would re re reiterate a little bit of what I said already and add one element to it. Yeah, that's great. Go yeah. ahead. So I would say that the, the, for me, off the top of my head right now, the four most important things are very definitely the first one is creating a personal cosmology putting a lot of work into examining what do I actually believe right now and where did it come from and uh, what is a better belief system, what is kind of more aligned with, with, with God. So the first one is um, creating a personal cosmology. The second one is either attaching yourself to an existing intentional community or creating one yourself. Set up a group. It can, it can be as small as eight people, you know? People who are going to both uh, support you in your search and challenge you in your belief systems. So every one of us needs some kind of a, a community. That's number two. Number three would be to um, have some regular disciplined practices like meditation, you know, our time spent in nature, our time spent with, with kids or repeating mantras, but that there's a regular kind of a, a, a process of, of a spiritual a activity. And the last one is I have to believe that we volunteered. You have to you have to know and trust that you volunteered to be here now. You weren't blindsided. You didn't find yourself on planet Earth instead of someplace else, and you didn't find yourself in the late twentieth century. Uh, you know by mistake. You saw what the situation was going to be like, and you volunteered and you said, "Send me this great prayer of Isaiah." Here I am, Lord. I heard you calling in the night. It is I. Send me. I, so that I may hold your people in my heart. Every single one of us has to hold Gaia in our heart. So that realization, this is no accident. You know, it's not bad luck. I volunteered precisely to be here and to be here at this time in human history. So that would be the four 
Yeah, I, I would advocate. Fantastic. I, I, I'm going to listen to this podcast probably three or four or five times, and I'm going to go through and make my own notes and, and, and build my own structure. I encourage everybody else to do that as well. If you have any kind of final comments, Sean, for listeners, for me, or even that you want to have yourself hear yourself say after what we've covered today, how would you like to, to, to kind of bring this to a close? So I've been thinking a lot over the last few months about uh, the notion of um, receptors and transmitters and the notion of um, entanglement theory in quantum mechanics, entanglement theory, the belief system that everything is connected to everything. Einstein poo-pooed it. He called it spooky action at a distance. But a brilliant Irish physicist called John Bell in 1964, Jung, or at least um, Einstein, posited that there must be some hidden variable which was accounting for the apparent entanglement. Uh, yeah, John Bell Bell's proved theorem. That, yeah, Bell's theorem proved that there is no such hidden variable. And then 20 years later, a French physicist, Alan Spector, I think his name was, showed it. Uh, Alan Aspect, he proved in his laboratory, you know, that the entanglement is a, is a fact. I think he actually got the Nobel Prize just last year uh, for this. And so this notion of a kind of a non-local consciousness, this field of intelligence into which we're plugged. And I created this taxonomy a few weeks ago that at various levels, there are receptors which are adequate to downloading particular kinds of information. And so the first one level is, I call it the, uh, um, the organ-specific receptor. So your heart is receiving information from the uh, field of consciousness that your kidney is not receiving. So your heart is receiving only the kind of information that teaches it how to be a heart. And your kidney is re receiving only the kind of information that's teaching it how to be a kidney. So I call that organ-specific receptor. And then there's organism-specific, that the entire organism you know, is held together as a unit by a different level of a receptor. So even though you're, you're losing a half a million cells every single second, after a two-hour conversation, you are still Paul Check, and you know that you are Paul, Paul Check. So there's a receptor you know, dedicated to you as an organism that never allows you to forget who you are as a totality, even though the component parts are changing radically. The third one is a kind of the human version, particularly DNA. And DNA is really, really specific to the individual person. You're receiving information from the field that I'm not receiving because you're building Paul Check and I'm building Sean O'Leary out of it. And I think that there's a portion of the DNA. Some people call it the junk DNA, but it's not junk. It is the unused bandwidth that allows us access to intuition, deja vu, synchronicities, uh, uh, visionary experiences. All these things are available when we can widen the bandwidth. Then I think there's, there's a species-wide receptor that allows us to identify ourselves as human beings. You know, there's, I came across this beautiful example. If you take a colony of bees, and the queen is acting as a receptor into the non-local field of consciousness, and she's actually directing all of the activities of all of the members of the hive. And even if you remove her several miles away, she's still directing the activities of the hive because she's the receiver and transmitter for, for um, a kind of a colony-specific receptor. If you kill the queen, all activity ceases immediately in the hive. There's no instructions coming from anywhere. And so there's kind of the species-specific receptor. I think there's a planetary uh, uh, specific receptor, you know, that our planet itself is receiving information as to how to be Gaia. It's created a magnetosphere, you know, to protect us against radiation. So Gaia knows how to be a planet because it has a different receptor cell. I think our solar system does. So it's creating a heliosphere that moves way even beyond Pluto teaching it how to be you know, a solar system. The Milky Way galaxy has a receptor teaching it how to be a galaxy. And the cosmos itself has a receptor teaching it how to be a cosmos. And all of that was planned when the fractals, holographic fractals of source got together with source and they kind of uh, created the notion of uh, a cosmos and all the subcomponents. So it becomes really important then that God did not ask us to volunteer to be in this dense three-dimensional kind of level of our spacesuits without giving us the full complement of the resources we need to become ascended beings and to, re and to, to recall our divinity. Yeah, we're not here without equipment. We're not here without resources. And it's important for people to realize that. No matter how dark the times are, there's enough light in you. It's an actual fact. There's enough, there's enough light. The, um, all matter is frozen light, literally. So every single, you know, cell and atom in your body is, is, is a photon of light. 
If you could release the light in a single human body, you could light up a baseball stadium at one million watts for three and a half hours. So if you could, if you can access that light, and it's not just a kind of a physical electromagnetic uh, phenomenon, it is a kind of the light of spirit itself. If you can access that and believe in that, there is no problem, which is which is uh, too much for you as a human being or us as a species. And the worst thing that would happen in any situation is that one would die. And, you know, my feeling about that is that because in my personal cosmology, God is unconditional love, there's, there's nothing at all to worry about because who is looking through your eyes and breathing you isn't subject to the laws of physics, classic physics. So to, to die is really to paradoxically be born to the greater self. Absolutely. Yeah. It, is to discard, it is to discard all these limitations because when we, when we volunteer for incarnation on this uh, level of density, there are four limitations we voluntarily you know, accept. And the first one is we trade a cosmic um, space for, look, in my case, 150 pound, you know, spacesuit. Uh, we trade cosmic intelligence for this little laptop that we carry between our ears. Because the laptop is so small, we have to invent time because the mind is not capable, the brain at least is not capable of grokking the entire gestalt. So we have to break it up into bite-sized pieces and process them sequentially, thus giving rise to the illusion of time. And then finally, there's amnesia created in us for who we are and why we've come. And the objective of the mission is to remember who God is, who I am, who the neighbor is, and what the mission is. And at that stage, the limitations dissolve, and I have access to all the resources I need in order to fulfill my mission. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's such honest wisdom right there. Can you please share where to find your your website uh your offerings uh setting god free i know is on amazon um and it's probably on your website but anything that you'd like to share so that people can find what you'd like them to have access to right so the easiest way to kind of find me is um my website which is spirits in space suits dot com all one word spirits in space suits because i believe that these are just space suits that we're wearing we're spirit beings having human experience for which we need these kind, this kind of apparatus. So spiritsinspacesuits.com and you'll find access to all of the homilies, uh, all of the books, you know, a Facebook a page and um, an Instagram page. They're all, they're all there. Great. Yeah. That's fantastic. I, I um, selfishly want to have many more podcasts with you. So I hope that you don't mind. I get so much out of it because I can ask you questions and, and I just feel your soul and your soul is so powerful. It, it, it gives me a lot of courage when I'm with you. And, and you know, it's not like I'm a guy that's in need of a, a daddy figure or a teacher, but I have a real strong sense of when I'm in the presence of wisdom and it, it brings me, you know, I, when I'm with you, I feel you, you're bringing more coherence into me and you're reminding me of, the truths of who I am and why I'm here and, and what's important to me. And you embody that. So it's, it, it helps me to see more of what I really came here to be. And I think that we all need that. I'm just very grateful, Sean, for you and for your life and for, you know, all you've brought to all of us. And, you know, your book, Setting God Free, is a masterpiece. <laughs> It's a Thank freaking you. masterpiece, man. That book, that's a book, that's a book that can make you laugh as hard as you can laugh and cry <laughs> as hard as you can cry. And it's kind of like a shamanic journey in a book, you know. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's just like I remember when I first well, I, I met you on Gaia first by watching you in an interview with Regina Meredith. And so I was like, I I was like, I'm gonna get that book and read it as fast as I can. And so I just felt like, 
you know, God works in mysterious ways, you know, and, and so uh, I think anybody that wants to really have a good look at the truth of God and how to set God free within themselves should, should if, if, you, if you haven't figured out how deep and wise Sean is now, setting God free will give you something you can do a little <laughs> bit of every day and you'll have Sean right inside of you teaching you everything we've been talking about and showing you how to look at religion very, very consciously. So uh, lots of love, Sean. Thanks for all of you listening. I'm, I think it's pretty obvious it's time for us all to be spiritual warriors. I also, for me, closing, I think it's important that we make the transition from feeling nervous, anxious, and afraid to saying, my God, this is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to really shine our light and to really reach out and hold the hands of those that are scared and to really help people through you know, loving confrontation to, to really evaluate values and say, you know, are, are you really sure that's what's important to you if it's not wise? Um, you know, <laughs> worrying about what model of cell phone you have before you think about the quality of the water you're drinking or where your food's <laughs> coming from is a little backwards. So I, I think it's just a great time for all of us. I think it's, it's, I think what the world is showing us is that our education system isn't reliable and then it's time for us to take responsibility for our own education and that religious systems have been corrupted and it's time for us to, as you say, have our own personal cosmology, which would be right in line with individuation and becoming whole unto ourselves and sharing that with everybody. So when I was a fighter, I didn't have the idea like, oh, I'm afraid to get in the ring. I might get beat. I had the idea of like, okay, I'm ready for this. And if this guy can beat me, he's the first person I'm going to hug and kiss because I'm going to make <laughs> damn sure that he has to work for it. You know, we used to have a saying on the army boxing team. Our job is to give our opponent maximum opportunity to lose. <laughs> <laughs> And so I think it's our job to give those that are out of alignment with the values that are supportive of the life of the planet and, and humanity and freedom as a whole, maximum opportunity to upgrade their own truth because we can exemplify a greater to, truth to them and we can prove to them that we don't need them as our mommy and daddy figures anymore. We are willing to and can invent better systems, new systems, even if we have to come up with our own currency and our own power generation systems, whatever. You know, the old saying, how do you make a diamond? Pressure, pressure, pressure. And I think right now is, is the time for us all to, to get creative together and get, get our heads together and celebrate and, and, you know, dance and sing enough to remind ourselves to be happy in the process. Because if you get too scared, you get in your left brain, there's no more creativity. You're in survival mode. So I think we're all going to do fantastic together. I, I'm excited. And I know I'm raising two beautiful little geniuses that are, both of their souls told me they came specifically to be here for this. And they both wow. carry gifts that they're here to give and I'm dead serious that that's exactly what they told me and so uh, I, I take I think all of us that are parents right now need to really be aware that there's a lot of um, star seeds coming into the world to help bring balance and so we've got to protect these beautiful children and educate them well and teach them nonviolent communication and teach them how to eat and, and how to have four doctors and and uh, how to live and love fully so they can go out into the world and and uh, do some good gardening. <laughs> from, your, from your mouth, Paul, to God's ear. All right, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to say thank you to all of you for joining me and Sean today and for being spiritual warriors. If you love this podcast as much as I did, please share it with as many people as you can. Um, the more people that I think read Sean's book and find Sean's guidance, the better. Thank you to my sponsors for all your love and support and the amazing products you make and your commitment to sustainable and regenerative practices to make the world a better place and for producing products that actually really do work well and do what they say they will. 
And uh, I look forward to sharing something more with all of you next podcast. And lots of love until then. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Father Sean O'Leary. Visit Sean's website at spiritsinspacesuits.com where you can read and watch more from Sean and find information on upcoming events such as his 2024 retreat, Taking a Breather Between Incarnations, on March 17th to 20th. You can also follow him on Instagram and YouTube at spiritsinspacesuits and Sean's latest book, Setting God Free, Moving Beyond the Caricature We've Created in Our Own Image, is now available on Amazon.com and Audible.com. Catch up with Paul on Instagram, TikTok, and threads at paul.check, on X at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to all the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. This podcast would not be possible without the support of our premier sponsors, Bioptimizers, Organifi, and Paleo Valley, and our podcast sponsor, Wild Pastures. Please show your appreciation by taking advantage of their special discounts for listeners. The links are in the show notes. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review on the podcast platform of your choice. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. 